Hey, it's Matthew Decker with Leverage Wealth Management. Today we are talking about tax-free income for life. And when it comes to tax-free income for life, it probably helps to start the conversation with what types of income is, is actually available besides just you know tax-free income. So there's a couple main types of income that can be generated uh, just in your daily life. So you can have W-2 income. You know, you go, you work, you get W-2 income, you pay ordinary income taxes on that income. You can have capital gains income, long or short term. It depends on how long you hold the asset. Less than a year is short term, more than a year is long term. And those are taxed at different rates. Then you can have tax deferred monies where you put money into an investment and it comes out totally taxable at ordinary income rates later on down the road. Today though, we're talking about tax-free income where you can put money away, it can grow, you can use it later, and you're never taxed on it. So why in the world would you want tax-free income besides the obvious, it's not taxable? Let me share my screen with you and show you exactly why tax-free income in today's environment is more and more popular. So what we've got here are the top marginal tax brackets going all the way back to 1913. And what's crazy about this, if we go on the right side of this page here, 18, 19, and 20, top marginal rate, 37%. When you look at that 37% rate, and if you find yourself in the top marginal rate, you might think like, man, I am paying so much in taxes that it's like, it's nauseating, it's bleeding me dry. And sometimes I feel that way, and I'm sure that you probably do too. But when you actually look at this chart, there's huge chunks of time where the top marginal rate was quite a bit worse than what it is now. Uh, in fact, for the majority of history, the top marginal rate is a lot higher than the 37% that presents itself right now. In fact, the, the highest top marginal tax bracket rate was in 1944, 1945 at 94%. We spent between 1936 and 1981, between 1936 and 1981, for that stretch of almost 50 years, the top marginal rate was above 70% for that entire time. Now you may be thinking, well, yeah, but that's in the past. Why does that matter if taxes were higher back then and they're lower now, that, that seems like a good thing. And I would say, well, yeah, that, that could be a good thing if our country actually had things in order and if we weren't stockpiling massive amounts of debt that we're gonna have to, at some point, pay in the future. So this is a great website slash tool that I like. It's called usdebtclock.org. If you haven't ever checked that out, I would encourage you to check it out. It's a real time kind of ticker tape of how much debt and spending our government is spending on a by the second basis. And so when we took this snapshot a couple days ago, our total US national debt was $28 trillion, uh, $28 trillion. Now that's pretty terrifying considering we only collect $3.8 trillion in total federal tax revenue on a year by year basis. And yet we spend $6.8 trillion on a year by year basis. Meaning right now we're running a $3 trillion per year deficit that is just ever increasing our total US national debt. Now, unfortunately, that's only part of the story. When we talk about our US national debt, our government accounts uh, differently than you and I would actually order our books and do accounting. Our government only recognizes liabilities as they come due. So there's another number on this US debt clock that I wanna share with you, and it's far, far worse. And what it is is total US unfunded liabilities. So I've just gone ahead and pulled up the usdebtclock.org so that we can look at it and you can see these numbers tallying in real time. But what I wanna focus in on here is actually at the bottom of this ledger, US unfunded liabilities, $157 trillion of future unfunded liabilities, largely made up of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and government pensions. 
And so this $157 trillion represents money that we have already promised to pay, but are not yet paying on. And why are we talking about this? The reason that we're talking about this is because we have a debt problem, and I don't think anybody, regardless of the political spectrum that you may fall on, I don't think anybody would disagree that our country has a debt problem. And it's important to understand how we may go about solving that debt problem. And I've got news for you. There's only two ways that you can solve this problem. The government only has two levers that it can pull on to solve a debt problem. And those two levers are very simple and very straightforward. Number one, the government can spend less. They can spend less. Now, they're already spending $3 trillion more than they're taking in, so they'd have to cut their spending in half to get to even, to stop the bleeding. Now, that doesn't include the fact that the interest on our debt is accruing, but let's just assume that they cut their spending in half and you can stop the bleeding. They'd have to cut it further to actually start making progress towards tackling our debt problem. So spending less doesn't seem like something that's actually a viable solution, especially considering how polarized Washington is at this point in time. The second lever that our government can pull on is you already know, they can tax more. So they can spend less, they can tax more, they'd have to spend more than $3 trillion less to even make a cent of a debt in our debt problem, a cent of a dent in our debt problem, uh, and they can tax more at will, and they likely will. In fact, the Trump tax cuts sunset in 2026, and there's even talk of them sunsetting them early. It has been proposed in several bills that are currently being looked at right now to sunset the tax cuts early, uh, the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, sunset that early and not wait until 2026 in order to generate more tax revenue. So if the only option that really exists for the government to solve our debt problem is to tax more, you can see why tax-free dollars would be something that would be extremely beneficial going into an environment where we've been living near or at all-time low tax rates uh, for a while now below 40% for 30, 40, 50 years. You can see, not even that long actually, about 35 years. You can see that, man, if there was ever a time to stop deferring money at low rates where you're gonna be taxed at ordinary income when you take it out at what future rate, who knows, this would be the perfect time to start paying the taxes even if you're at the top marginal rate, 37 is better than 50, is better than 80, is way better than 92, okay? Pay the taxes now, put it into a vehicle that's gonna be tax-free for the rest of your life. And so the next question becomes, well, what vehicles are actually tax-free? And this is actually a pretty easy question to answer because there's not very many options. The only vehicles that you have available to you that are truly tax-free growth and income vehicles are as follows. You have all of your Roth accounts. So Roth IRA, Roth 401k, Roth annuity, anything that says Roth on it, that is a tax-free asset. You can put money in, it grows tax-free, it comes out tax-free, it will always be tax-free, there's no RMDs on it, and it is generally a phenomenal vehicle. So all your Roth accounts, that's the first option for tax-free income that can grow and come out non-taxable. The second option is going to be municipal bonds. And municipal bonds, uh, regardless of how you may feel about bonds right now, which, you know, that's probably a whole nother video, municipal bonds generate tax-free income dividend payments, uh, interest payments. Not dividend payments, interest payments. So, even though the income is tax-free on municipal bonds, you should know that if you sell the municipal bond and experience a gain, that is taxable. But the income payments, the interest payments off of municipal bonds are tax-free and they will always be tax-free. Uh, we don't do a ton of municipal bonds here in our practice simply because you have to find a municipality that you trust that you actually think can fulfill its obligations and that can be a difficult thing in today's day and age. Uh, the last traditional asset that is truly tax-free is cash value life insurance. Uh, if you have cash value growth inside your life insurance contract, that money can grow tax-free and you can access it tax-free through withdrawals up to basis and then policy loans. 
Those are really the three types of vehicles that are truly tax-free, uh, embedded in IRS code, and you can rely on that. Roth accounts, municipal bonds, cash value life insurance. And you know, if you've watched this channel, we talk a lot about cash value life insurance because it has some really unique benefits over and above Roth IRAs, uh, Roth 401ks, and municipal bonds. Uh, now, that, does that mean it's a fit for everybody? No, it's not a fit for everybody. But for some people, specifically high income earners who maybe can't contribute to a Roth IRA because of income limitations, or those looking to put away vast sums of money on a yearly basis and are looking for a higher risk profile than a municipal bond, cash value life insurance can be a phenomenal option for those people. I would also add as a bonus, the last type of income that you might be able to consider tax-free would be rental income if you're able to offset the rental income through depreciation. Now that comes with a whole other set of not necessarily problems, but obligations on your part, because at some point depreciation runs out, which means if you're going to use rental income uh, and you want it to be tax-free, you're gonna always have to be purchasing new assets in order to renew the depreciation that you have to offset the income. So those are the types of tax-free assets that exist. Uh, we do a lot of cash value life insurance. We advocate for a lot of Roth conversions, uh, a lot of funding of Roths if you're under the income limit in order to be able to do that. And the reason that we do that is because taxes are at an all-time low rate when you actually look at where they've been from a historical standpoint. Couple that with the fact that we have an enormous amount of outstanding debt and the only way to solve that debt problem is for the government to either spend less or tax more. There's never been a better time to start really getting into tax-free assets. If you have questions about generating tax-free income, we would love to talk with you. You can go to our website, leveragedwm.com slash contact us. You'll see a page that looks like this. You can book a call, a quick discovery call meeting with us right here from this page. This is our real-time calendar availability. We can chat about what you're trying to do, what your goals are, and if we can help you achieve those goals, we would love to do that. Again, this is going to be the first video in a series of videos talking about tax-free assets. We're going to do a deep dive on cash value life insurance as a tax-free income stream for life in future videos. And if you haven't already done so, subscribe to this channel. Make sure you click the bell so that you get notifications so that as we roll these videos out over the next four to six weeks, you can make sure that you get those notifications and stay informed on this series. So, thanks so much for joining me this time. Until next time, this has been Matthew Decker, Leverage Wealth. We'll talk to you soon.